o'clock pitch over. B-64, okay? Bam, LPD. LPD. Coming right. Out their window, they could see Four the zero. sinuous meanderings of the lunar LPD. canyon known as Hadley okay. Rill as they brought their lunar module, LPD. call sign Minus Falcon, 11. toward its landing and the beginning of what would be one of the most significant chapters in the history of scientific exploration. Nine percent fuel. Two hundred, minus eleven. One hundred and fifty, minus seven. Minus six. One hundred and twenty feet, minus six. Minus five, one hundred feet and five. Nine percent fuel. Minus five. Eighty at five. Minus three. 60 at 3. 50 at 3. Cross pointers look good. 40 at 3. 30, 3. 25, 2. They have got some dust. 7% fuel. 20 at 1. 15 at 1. 1. Minus one, six percent fuel. Ten feet, minus one. Eight feet, minus one. Contact. Man. Okay, you student, the Falcon is on the plane at Hadley. Roger, roger, Falcon. No denying that, we had contact. Houston, the Hadley base here, tell those geologists in the back room to get ready, because we've really got something for them. Scott and Irwin were located on an undulating plain situated between the Apennines and Hadley Rill, an area selected by the scientists as being one of the most geologically significant sites on the moon. Okay, overhead hatch is open and latch. Two hours after touchdown, Dave Scott stood up in Falcon's upper hatch to survey their landing area. Oh boy, what a view. Uh, I can see... Uh... Icarus. As Scott stood describing the craters and mountains, we on Earth perhaps did not yet realize the scope and extent of the coming mission. Aboard the lunar module was a small dune buggy-like car called the Lunar Roving Vehicle, or just plain Rover. The astronauts would travel miles in collecting samples and placing and conducting experiments. Uh, there are no sharp jagged peaks, there are no large boulders apparent anywhere. They would observe the layering of the lunar terrain, most clearly seen in the formation 14 miles to the south, called Silver Spur. This layering, later to be observed in the mountains and the rill, gives scientists a direct look at the structure of the moon and a deeper insight as to the significance of the collected samples. The journey of Apollo 15 had begun four days earlier, July 26, 1971. The crew, Dave Scott, spacecraft commander and veteran of Gemini 8 and Apollo 9. Jim Irwin, lunar module pilot, who would explore Hadley Rill and the Apennine Front with Scott. Al Warden, command module pilot, who would remain in lunar orbit operating an extensive array of cameras and experiments and making observations which, when coupled with the surface work of Scott and Irwin, would give the most comprehensive picture of the moon's structure and history ever achieved. We have complete clearance to launch. We are go. 15 seconds, guidance internal. 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start. Engines on, 5, 4, Precisely on schedule, 9.34 a.m., Apollo 15 lifted from the pad on its way to the moon. And we have a pitch program. Roger. Roger. With the exception of a few minor problems, the trip out would be uneventful. The command module Endeavour, carrying the lunar module Falcon, would arrive in lunar orbit with Scott's announcement, Hello, Houston. The Endeavour is on station with cargo, and what a fantastic sight. 
Oh, this is really profound. I'll tell you, this is absolutely mind-boggling up here. Gentlemen, I can well imagine that a foreign planet must be a weird thing to see. July 31st. After a night's rest, Dave Scott descended into the lunar morning. Okay, Houston, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I try to realize there's the fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. And this is exploration at, at its greatest. Scott was then joined by Jim Irwin. Oh boy, it's beautiful out here. Reminds me of Sun Valley. Their first job was to get the lunar roving vehicle out of its storage bay. Looks like she's coming down okay. Next, the astronauts tried out the rover. During this test drive, one failure showed up. The rover was designed to steer through both its front and rear wheels. I don't have any front steering, Joe. It's like just rear steering, Dave. Yeah. In use, the absence of front wheel steering would hardly be noticed. Then they loaded the equipment they would need for their geological survey and boarded the rover for their first exploration. Okay, we're moving forward, Joe. Roger. They were headed toward St. George Crater, located on a mountain slope above Hadley Rill to the south of the landing site. There would be a stop to collect samples at a smaller crater called Elbow, then arrival at the base of St. George, and a look into Hadley Rill. Scott then adjusted the television antenna on the rover. A quarter of a million miles away, in Houston's mission control, a flight controller operated the television camera mounted on the rover. Scientists and engineers on Earth could directly monitor the lunar exploration. And those of us at home watching on television felt like the third astronaut on the moon. That looks fairly recent, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. Okay, now we got the fillet. We got the soil, now we need to sample the rock. Yeah. The astronauts began to collect samples and photograph the area. The samples would consist of rocks picked up with a rake-like device, soil samples, selected rocks, and chips taken from boulders. Can you imagine that, Joe? Here sits this rock, and it's been here since before creatures roamed the sea on our little Earth. They would also drive core tubes into the lunar soil to collect contiguous specimens from beneath the surface. But now it was time to return to the lunar module. Not to end this first work period on the lunar surface, but to begin another phase. I can't believe uh, we came over those mountains. <laughs> they, we did. They're just a beautiful little valley. Yeah, those are pretty big mountains to fly over, aren't they? After returning to the LEM to load equipment, they moved to a nearby location to set up a science station similar to those left on previous missions. With the establishment of these experiments, a network of scientific stations was achieved which would allow triangulation of events and give us the ability to locate precisely